Well, um, you know, I'm going to get us going here. And uh, we've got uh, uh, several people on uh, Facebook. And uh, we're still getting an audience uh, coming in on Zoom. So maybe we'll get started. Um, hello, everybody. Where are you and why is my <laughs> usual question. So uh, you, welcome to the September 2022 uh, East Bay Astronomical Society general meeting. Hope everyone is doing well. I uh, hope you all survived the heat from the last week. It was pretty miserable. Um, Teddy, how is it down in LA right now? Did it cool off today? Uh, it's a little, it's cooled down a little bit, but it's pretty muggy. Uh, it's actually kind of nice that we actually have some rain. Yeah, that's uh, good. We didn't. In a while. Hasn't gotten up here yet, but it did cool off, so I felt a lot better today. As did as did the family and the cats. Um, everybody was much happier. The tropical uh, storm is proving that it's an ill wind that blows no good. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, Dave, I'm gonna. Ow! One announcement is uh, some of you may notice I am wearing an East Bay Astronomical Society T-shirt. These are new. It's been a long time since uh, EIS printed t-shirts up, and there's going to be instructions pretty soon coming your way on how to order yours uh, or where to find them. Um, we have a limited run. Uh, we printed them up thinking that uh, it would be nice to, uh, nice to have some additional articles of clothing uh, suggestive of the East Bay Astronomical Society. And uh, it's a lot better to have shirts than socks, as far as I'm concerned. So um, without further ado, uh, Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Um, and as usual, we will hold questions till the end of Teddy's talk, and uh, at which point we will either relay them through the chat or Q&A, um, or uh, attempt to use that new uh, yeah, newfangled feature on Zoom that allows uh, me to select individuals to show up and ask the question directly. You could raise your hand and then I'll be able to pick you. So uh, that's about it. Okay. Dave, it's Thank all you yours. Thank you very much, Rich. You're welcome. Well, tonight, it's this is a talk I've been looking forward to for quite a while. Um, this is one of the most remarkable yeah. accomplishments that our species has ever achieved. The first time we've been able to fly a vehicle on another planet. And tonight's speaker is, Te is Teddy Zanetos, who first became interested in space exploration like so many of us by watching the Apollo and shuttle missions. Teddy graduated from MIT with a BS in computer science and electrical engineering in 2012 and a master's of engineering in 2013 in the same fields. And after working in the private sector, he joined G JPL in 2017. And in a few short years, Teddy, can you believe it? You've gone from starting work on ground support equipment to becoming the team leader of Ingenuity. So without any further ado, Teddy Zanetos. Go ahead, Teddy. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, dialing in tonight. Um, I hope you guys are uh, excited to hear a little bit about Ingenuity, Mars Helicopter. Uh, I have a talk prepared uh, where I'll walk through our, our history. What have we done on the surface so far? Um, what's What does the future of flight at Mars look like? Uh, way ahead into the future and, and uh, a more recent update uh, that's happened in the last month and a half about uh, on the five to 10 year horizon of, of flight at Mars. Um, at any point, uh, I understand Richard was talking about the Q&A opportunities uh, and, and Richard, I'll, I'll defer to you on how, how you'd like to run the Q&A, but I'm happy to answer questions midstream. You know, if, if hands get if hands are raised, I'm happy to, to, to deal with them. Um, you know, very laid back, informal sort of presentation here. So again, uh, thank you all for dialing in. I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, yeah, let's 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 jump in here. Uh, so let's see if the screen share works properly here. Okay, can I get an audio cue or a thumbs up from Dave or Richard? Looks, looks good, Teddy. We can see it. Okay. All right. So, uh, I assume you all know what Ingenuity is. Um, if not, a, just a quick brief here, a quick primer. Ingenuity is this little baby on the surface. This is our helicopter. It's our four pound uh, coaxial rotorcraft at Mars. And the point of Ingenuity is to be a technology demonstrator. 
right? Um, it was attached as an add-on to the Perseverance uh, Mars 2020 rover mission that we see here. And this is actually a selfie image that the rover took using its arm, extending its arm out and taking a selfie image of itself uh, and uh, our little baby Ingenuity during the month of Ingenuity, the 30 souls that were solely dedicated for our mission. Um, so what's a lot of people ask is, you know, what's the point? Why? Why send something to Mars to fly? Why is it so hard? You know, we've been flying here on Earth for 100 years. Uh, we know how to fly. It should be easy. Um, that's not true uh, purely from a physics standpoint. Uh, the conditions at Mars are, are pretty brutal. Um, first off, we're far away. That means that you can't joystick any aircraft at Mars, any most robots uh, specifically, uh, or more generally rather. Um, there's a, about a 15 minute lag time, right? And for anyone that's familiar with video games, uh, lag time is pretty critical um, as, or with RC uh, aircraft or RC uh, robots in general, lag time is important. And a 15 minute lag time would mean that if anything were, strange were to happen uh, mid-flight, uh, you'd result in a crash, right? So you need your aircraft to be autonomous. Um, the biggest physical challenge aside from the autonomy is actually the air density, right? There's almost no atmosphere at Mars. It's 1% the density of Earth. You move your arms around here on Earth, the hairs on the back of your arms feel the reaction force of moving around um, uh, air molecules, right? Uh, a lot of nitrogen, oxygen, um, and so on. On Mars, there's 1% that density that you feel on Earth. So you wouldn't feel a thing on Mars if you wave your arms around. Um, that means that you need very large rotor blades. In general, the, the way that aircraft scale is that the larger aircraft are, the larger your lifting surfaces are, you're, the more efficient you are. Um, but you need to be lightweight and you need to spin your rotor blades very, very quickly. It's also very cold. Uh, Mars is not very hospitable. Uh, Forget uh, uh, life, uh, but even for robots, it's not very hospitable. Um, it can get down to negative 90 degrees Celsius at night. Uh, and that means that your batteries, which are lithium ion, for those of you familiar with lithium technology, uh, they don't do, uh, that technology doesn't do so well at, at cold temperatures. Uh, so your lithium cells are, 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 are subject to those cold temps. Your commercial off the shelf electronics are subject to those temperatures. And really every single solder joint, there's thousands of solder joints and, and micro connections and vias on board Ingenuity, um, utilizing a lot of the technology that's in your cell phone, right? And every single time you cold cycle overnight and then warm up during the day, it's like if you ever take a piece of metal and bend it back and you bend it back and forth five times, 10 times, you get to 30 or 40 and eventually it'll snap. Right? You're undergoing plastic deformation every single time and it's yielding and it's incurring some damage and eventually things will break. Uh, it's one of the key challenges about designing Ingenuity is how to, how to survive the cold nights, how to thermally manage uh, the heat produced, um, the heat energy we would absorb from the sun and make sure that we survive the night as best uh, we could. So active temperature control uh, and then build the external parts to be as reliable as possible. And related to the solar energy, we need to be self-sufficient. There's no going back to the rover, right? One of the premises of our, uh, one of the core foundations of the design here is that once Ingenuity was detached from the Perseverance rover, um, we would never go back and reattach. We can't plug in to charge. We need to be self-sufficient, have our own solar panel to charge the batteries. Here's our baby, all right? So this is a, a pre-launch uh, image of our final flight configuration of the Ingenuity helicopter. It's one of my favorite images. I'll, uh, I'll tour everyone through from the top down. Um, so starting at the top, we have a solar panel. You can see there's three strings of cells, of solar ray cells. Uh, these are cots. I'm gonna point out as much as I can uh, the commercial off the shelf part so that people get a sense for how much, uh, not that we necessarily have a desire to go to cots, but how much we needed to rely off commercial off the shelf parts because the advantages, the miniaturization and really the lightweight benefits of off the shelf components offer as opposed to heritage space components, which are sometimes not necessarily built to be lightweight but more so built to be reliable. Um, so we have off the shelf so, uh, solar cells. We have a Zigbee style 900 megahertz radio. So ISM band uh, same that you would use with walkie talkies, for example. Um, we have a coaxial counter-rotating rotor system. 
so the, the upper rotor rotates counterclockwise as, as viewed from above. The lower rotor rotates clockwise as observed from above. Um, two sets of swash plates. Um, so one swash plate per rotor motor. And that's how you control the angle of attack of the blades as they rotate around the central axis. This silver box on the bottom, that is our avionics bay. So that's where all of our electronics are, our Qualcomm Snapdragon processor. Um, if anyone had a Snapdragon, uh, a, a Samsung Galaxy phone, for example, like an S5, um, that's about what would have been on the market in around 2015. Um, so an S5 2015 cell phone is what's pairing Ingenuity. Um, our cameras are our regular COTS cell phone cameras, our inertial measurement unit, Again, MEMS, COTS components, and so are our batteries. If anyone has a power drill at home, that battery pack, if you tear it open, 18650 lithium ion cells, the you know regular uh, flooded in the market uh, battery technology that anyone can buy. Um, we used it because, oh, we got a, a question. Yeah, uh, Dave. Ed, uh, I'm sorry. You're probably about to answer this, uh, Teddy, but how many uh, watt hours can you store in your battery? Yeah, so it is a 40-watt uh, hour battery. Okay. And most of that we consume overnight in terms of trying to heat ourselves. Uh, we consume about 20 to 25% of that uh, in, a, in a two, three minute flight. Um, mm -hmm. And then we immediately land and try and recharge as best we can so that we can survive the overnight power draw. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then you see our landing gear. Uh, here's our team. None of this would have been possible without the team. Here's our original project manager, Mimi Young, and Bob Ballarm, our chief engineer. And you know this team, um, it's not just NASA JPL, it's other NASA centers as well. Uh, Ames Research Center, Langley Research Center, um, Qualcomm, uh, I mentioned earlier, Aero Environment, who built most of the structure, is a, a very significant partner of ours with Ingenuity, um, Solero, uh, and a handful of others that, that, that helped us get to the surface of Mars and fly for the first time ever. Um, there were also a partnership with Lockheed Martin who developed the deployment system to, to actually house Ingenuity while we were in cruise and then do the final deployment once we we're on the surface. All right, so what is the technology demonstrator? Uh, that means we're high risk, high reward, right? Um, from, from a success criteria perspective, Ingenuity did not need to succeed for Mars 2020 to be a successful mission, right? Um, if we had a critical fail failure before launch, we wouldn't have been attached. If it was after launch, we would have been left powered off for the remainder of the mission. Um, and there's no science goal. There is no science payload on Ingenuity. There's no science objective. The only objective is just to prove that we can. Prove that we can fly on Mars, check the box for future generations to move forward with that capability and run with it, just like we did with the Wright brothers, right? They, they proved for, for humanity that flight is possible. And, and now, you know, here's where we are flying on other planets, right? Um, we, because we were a tech demo and because we were a high risk, high reward, there were multiple chances or multiple opportunities for our mission to kind of go on an off ramp, right? And call, call it end of mission early. Um, the first big challenge for us was just surviving launch loads. Um, launch is a violent experience. The highest structural loads in terms of, uh, uh, you know, take any part of the helicopter, the mast, the, the, the legs, the feet, the blades, um, the highest loads on all of those components is experienced during launch, not during flight, not during takeoff, not during landing of, of the helicopter itself, or even being dropped, you know, five inches from, from the rover down to the surface, the uh, surface of Mars, uh, but it's launch. The, that vibration, that shaking, it really pushes your components to, to their limits. So we survived launch, thankfully. Uh, we were able to talk to the helicopter soon thereafter. Um, after um, after launch, we, we spoke to the heli, and then we had about a, uh, what was it, uh, four, five-month cruise period um, where we periodically charged the helicopter battery about once every two weeks. Uh, it would We'd go up to 35% state of charge, it would drift down to 17, and then we'd send commands up uh, to the cruise stage to tell the rover to then charge the helicopter batteries. We did that 17 times uh, during cruise. Uh, check, and we survived entry, descent, and landing, February 18th of 21, check. Uh, and then we survived our 100% charge. First time we charged to 100% state of charge with a battery, which is, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a trivial activity to do with a battery pack that's 
been sent all the way to Mars, <laughs> especially since they're off the shelf cells. Um, we were deployed from the rover on April 3rd and we survived our first night. Again, a big check for the mission. Um, within a week, we started our commissioning process where we spun our blades for the first time. We did a 50 RPM, similar to a control surfaces check uh, or pre-flight check that pilots do here on earth. Uh, we, 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 we adopted the same approach and decided, hey, we wanna make sure that once we're dropped from the rover as best we can, uh, and while keeping in mind our, our limited 30 sol uh, allowance for time, uh, we wanted to check out all of our systems to make sure that they were operating anomaly. Uh, commissioning was a success. And then thankfully uh, we made our first flight um, on April 19th of 21. I, I said it earlier and I really meant it, right? The goal was just to prove that we can knock out that first flight. And with this simple first flight, uh, we were able to, you know, mark our 100% our mission success criteria. Sorry for the rewinding of the video. Uh, oh, hopefully the video now works. Um, it was a simple 39 second flight. We took off, hovered at three meters AGL, uh, performed a 90 degree turn. Uh, again, just to check out our GNC capabilities um, and then came back down to land. Uh, it was a highlight of my life, all of our careers. So, for everyone on the team. And this is what we had been building up to for about six years. Um, myself, you know, six years and for some people longer, you know, for myself, I only joined at 20, around 2017, but Mars helicopter from a concept really started around 2013, 2014, going back with our chief engineer. Since then though, we've been a little busy. I hope this animation's working out because I, I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, after flight one, uh, we really started stretching our, 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 our wings, if you'll allow the expression. Um, our, our, the, the start of the mission was this blue box here, this blue shaded region where you see flights one through three. Um, and then we executed flights four and five. And at that point, we, we officially uh, were at the end of our mission. Um, we were funded for 30 SOLs. Uh, we had planned for 30 SOLs with the rover. And you know, you know, you need to keep in mind that Flying a helicopter on Mars incurs a cost, not just a, a monetary cost to support the team, but also an operational cost. Um, every time you fly, that takes preparation time, working with the rover team. The rover team needs to integrate that plan into their larger plan. Uh, and, and every second on Mars that the rover is not doing its mission, which is to collect samples and, and prepare them for return, uh, eventual return back to Earth, um, you know, that, that's costing them from their mission. Right. Uh, so we decided at the end of the 30 soul mission to, hey, we could call it here uh, or we could figure out how to continue the mission, try and become more streamlined, try and become more efficient in terms of our operations burden uh, to the Mars 2020 mission and try and see if we can aid the rover team, try and see if we can aid 2020 in acting as a scout, for example. Right. Uh, the helicopter can fly to locations that the rover has not yet explored um, or may never explore and capture some reconnaissance, capture some imagery, um, either for science or outreach purposes. And it also affords our Mars helicopter aircraft team the opportunity to keep learning, right? Every flight is a chunk of data, is a chunk of knowledge that we didn't have before uh, that we could store away and, and again, hand off to the next generation of aircraft designers from Mars. Um, thankfully, NASA agreed, uh, and, and we got additional funding to keep flying. And that's what you see here. Uh, I'll restart the animation so you can get an idea of it. Flight six, seven, uh, eight. Flight nine was one of our record-breaking flights where the white path is everywhere the rover went, and the green path is everywhere Ingenuity went. Uh, and, and there's this triangular shape, shape region called CETA that the rover was trying to get around so it could explore South CETA. Um, the rover's not capable of driving through here, but the helicopter's capable of flying over, right? So it was our first shortcut demonstration on Mars, a 625 meters, a uh, far cry from our original three meter AGL, you know, 40 second flight. Uh, here we were pushing 170 seconds. Uh, we flew across CETA. We explored this area called Ray's Ridges, which was an area earmarked for scientific uh, interest. Um, we sent the helicopter out first, imaged it, and the scientists realized wasn't as interesting as they thought it was. Again, that's useful, that's valuable, that's saving the scientists and the rover uh, time and kilometers driven on the surface. 
Uh, we flew up to South Sita, where the rover team wanted to explore. Got some beautiful three-dimensional imagery I'll be showing here in a couple of slides. Uh, and then made our way back. We knew that the rover team eventually was going to drive all the way back here this is to get to the ancient river delta entrance. Um, so again, instead of flying all the way around with the rover, uh, we took a shortcut. And we cut that across a handful of flights here, flights 21, 22, 23, 24. Our longest flight to date, flight 25, which was 704 meters. Um, and then in the last six months, we've been working on flight 26, 27, and just recently, we executed Flight 31 uh, a week ago. So it's been a whirlwind journey of, of starting off small and baby stepping our way up from a simple pop-up flight up and down uh, to really becoming an aerial explorer and scout uh, around the surface of Mars. Uh, here are statistics. So uh, the number of SOLs achieved. So we were deployed on SOL 43. That, that's when we were dropped from the rover. Number of flights, distance flown, and time flown. Uh, so we're a little over seven kilometers and just about one hour of total uh, flight time aloft on the surface of Mars, 31 flights total. This column shows in our original tech demo what we had signed up for for the 30 days. And what we're in now is what we're calling the operations demonstration. So tech demo was the first 30 souls. And then after that is our operations demonstration. And then you can see the percentage comparison of, you know, what we were originally planning for and, and what we've accomplished above and beyond that. Um, so it, it's, been a, it's been a remarkable success for the team, for the aircraft, for the designers. And it still uh, continues to be. Thankfully, ingenuity is still healthy. We've had our hurdles. Uh, we're in the middle of, of, of a challenging period on Mars uh, right now, uh, where we're in its seasonal uh, lull of available energy. We're, we're around winter time right now on Mars um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And because of that, uh, Ingenuity is facing some of its hardest challenges in terms of how much energy it can capture or recharge its batteries with during the day versus how much energy is needed overnight to try and keep itself warm. And since uh, I believe early May, um, I need to go back and double check the dates, uh, but for the last about 124 sols, um, we have not been able to maintain our heaters overnight. It's been that cold and the energy has been that sparse. Uh, and, and we're in this freezing period where overnight, instead of staying at a nominal temperature overnight, a nice warm negative 20 degrees Celsius, uh, our batteries actually die every night and we wind up uh, going down to ambient close to negative 90. So we're really pushing the limits. You know, we're beyond the original warranty period. Uh, if you want to think of it uh, in terms of, uh, of a car, uh, you, 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 we've gone past the manufacturer's warranty and, and we're operating well beyond that. Um, so every day, every soul could be our last. Um, but while we're aware of that risk, that doesn't mean we're going to, you know, stop where we are. We're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep flying for as long as we can. Uh, to try and help the rover team, but also to try and learn uh, more and more about flying on Mars. Uh, Dave, I see you got a question. I'm sorry, Teddy. The reason they made me program director is I asked half the questions. So it was poetic. Oh, yes. Um, this image, uh, first, I want to compliment you on the, uh, the animation you did. Uh, when I read the Sky and Telescope <laughs> article about it, I got confused as to where what was happening when, because there's a lot of balls that are being juggled in the air, if you'll pardon that semi yep. uh, The delta, as I recall, is about 100 meters high. Uh, is that right? It depends which, which uh, approach you take, uh, yeah. but it's on the order of, of dozens of meters. Um, so there are gentler approaches. Right now, we're, we're, the rover team may be going up this blue line, uh -huh. um, but eventually the total delta, I think it's on the order of 100 or so. Uh, don't quote me on that. I need to double check. But but yeah, what we're looking now at the delta front here yeah. uh, is is dozens of meters. Yes. So, so when like I was around reading 50 about, or 60. When I was reading about this again, uh, you know, one of my future fantasies is one of the descendants of Ingenuity flying along in Val Marineris and just examining the cliffs there, which would be a stunning uh, video and image to see. But it occurred to me, uh, would it be possible for you guys to fly Ingenuity, uh, Ginny, uh, up 100 meters. Can you go up that high and then go over to the top of the uh, the delta? So there's a there's a couple of questions wrapped in into that. Um, from an aerodynamic standpoint, yes, it's possible, right? So can the rotors handle that? Yes. Um, from a sensor standpoint, Ingenuity's design has a challenge. It's not a showstopper, but it's a challenge in that our laser altimeter. Uh, so, so our sensor package is comprised of an IMU, so that's an accelerometer and a gyroscope. We have an altimeter, we have a color camera, which is not used for navigation, just for photography, 
a black and white downward facing feature camera. So, so, so that is used for navigation um, and a downward looking laser altimeter. Uh, that laser altimeter around 25 meters or so, uh, our, our readings start becoming less and less reliable. Mm -hmm. um, now that doesn't mean you can't go above 25 meters. It's, it's now that, it, that just means that your filters performance, your navigation filters performance uh, will start to degrade once you take that sensor out of your, your, uh, your, your system. Mm -hmm. um, it is feasible to write software to allow yourself to go above 25 meters or change the existing software to, to tune it so that you can do that, keep climbing. Mm -hmm. And as you keep climbing, your, your, your accuracy will start to degrade, get to 100 meters, then you can come back down. Mm -hmm. or presumably get up to the cliff, uh, you know, vertical cliff wall, translate over and then try and land. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of nuance there in terms of uh, uh, guidance uh, planning for, for such a situation. Yeah. Um, however, uh, right now we're in the middle of a flight software upgrade effort um, to help us with just that problem where mm -hmm. uh, we're going to, we're feeding in, we're, we're changing our, our navigation uh, system right now so that um, we can feed in the capability of a, an existing digital elevation map, it's called a DEM. Um, and you can imagine, we have these satellite images, we have three-dimensional maps of Jezero Crater. Um, and if we're going up a specific vector, let's say we're coming up this way, I, I can't, uh, do you guys see my mouse? Yeah, we can. Yeah, so let's say you're attacking this way, this way, or we're coming around here, or we're mm -hmm. going up here, or the blue line, um, we could pre-calculate what that ground profile looks like uh -huh. right, as a function of time and then feed that ground profile uh, information into the helicopter's navigation system. Mm -hmm. By doing that, uh, you could much better navigate over the change in terrain uh -huh. uh, and potentially not need to take such a challenging 100 meter jump. But instead, you know, if there's a five meter uh, slope up or a 10 meter slope up, you can go, you can take those, those flights and still not suffer landing site uh, error. I see. Um, well, what I glossed over was a detail here um, that our system was built to fly in a very limited region, right? The, the original mission, uh, one of our requirements for, for being dropped off uh, by Perseverance is that we were gonna get dropped off in effectively a Martian parking lot. Right? We wanted a very flat terrain and we were gonna fly our first five flights in that very flat terrain. Um, and because of that, our system made an assumption that the world is flat. So mm -hmm. if there's any change in elevation, un uh, unintentional change in elevation um, that the helicopter observes with its altimeter, uh, that couples into or causes uh, potential error in our landing site, right? Um, so this new upgrade that we're working on will help us navigate over non-flat terrain and be able to get up this delta even quicker. Uh, so please stay tuned. Hopefully uh, things go well in the weeks ahead of us and we'll, our upgrade will be ready. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll patch it on the surface and we'll try our first DEM-based flight uh, coming soon. Great. That's very cool, Daddy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just some other context for, for everyone here, what we're looking at, you know, for those of you not familiar with what Jezero Crater is, uh, I don't have a, a further zoomed out view. Um, this is a small part of a massive crater. My mouse is tracing the, 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 the remainder of the circle here. This massive crater, and this we're calling this the Ancient River Delta. The reason 2020 landed here um, is because of this delta, right? Uh, like here on Earth, river deltas are places of life. There, there, there tend to be uh, an abundance of life, various different types of life at river deltas here on Earth. Um, uh, and the argument goes that, you know, if there's a river delta on Mars, maybe there's a good chance of finding signs of extant life or, or trying to help answer the question, are we alone? Um, so it's one of the reasons why the, the, the mission was designed to land near this river delta. Uh, and the, the extended missions now for the Perseverance rover is to drive up the delta and continue up tens and tens of kilometers further up uh, and continue to sample uh, in, in preparation for sample return. Um, Okay, let's keep moving. So here I have a couple of slides uh, to highlight s some, some key flights or, or key performance metrics. Um, our navigation data sets are really the, the gold mine here. Right? The whole point of this mission is to get our navigation data uh, so that aerodynamicists, guidance navigation control engineers 
aircraft designers can use that and improve aircraft design in the future. So we have accelerometer data, gyroscope, inclinometer, our laser rangefinder, our color and black and white camera uh, data sets, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I covered this earlier, but I mentioned the region, the region called the raised ridges, right? Uh, we can think of ingenuity as an efficiency multiplier, right? We flew over raised ridges. This is an image of raised ridges here. Uh, and, and we're able to capture an airborne shot, several airborne shots of the terrain and hand that off to the science team. They then decided, okay, this is not worth the investment in time and operations resources. Uh, and that's a win for us, right? Um, we're, we're helping out the rover team. Uh, then we, we, we further scouted here in, in the South Sita tow dip area, we were able to fly ahead, um, help the rover planners uh, reroute their, their, their drive plans. Um, if you're driving a rover on another planet, you want Intel as early as you can get it. Uh, and we tried our best to try and um, get this aerial imagery, you know, as many souls in advance um, as we could uh, for the rover drivers uh, the, the, and the rover planners to prepare their routes. Uh, and this is, an, again, another example of utility of an aircraft on Mars and helping them refine their plans. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite quotes, uh, really, in the, kind of highlighting the, the, the value or the utility of an aircraft, um, the project scientist, Ken Farley, right? Um, I'll, I'll let you all read it yourselves. Uh, I, I won't uh, uh, read it word for word, but effectively what I already mentioned, right? Um, it's a win-win anytime that the aircraft can help the rover become more efficient effectively. This is, I think, one of the coolest visual uh, representations of the bang for the buck or, or the value here of aircraft at Mars. Uh, we'll start off in the center of the screen um, in the pixelated image that that shows what orbital imagery can get us in terms of resolution. Um, after Ingenuity's flight number 13, we were able to project that imagery down onto this orbital map. And you can see just how much more crisp all the detail that comes alive uh, using a you know, 13 megapixel cell phone camera, a handful of meters off the surface. Um, what's more is that you can stitch together these high resolution images. Uh, with flight 13, we flew out along this green line and then flew out uh, orthogonally from our initial vector. And as we were flying, uh, as my mouse was tracing out, we took a series of, I think about eight uh, of these 13 megapixel images. Those images were then stitched together to form this three-dimensional map. Right. Wow. Um, and being able to, to, to generate these 3D maps and hand them off to the scientists and say, hey, uh, this is what the heli sees. Uh, would you guys like to go explore, right? It, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it, it's really, um, it, it's a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity to generate these data products, um, hand them off to, to scientists and engineers that, you know, when 2020 was planning their mission, they didn't expect to have these sorts of resources, right? Because again, no one could bank on ingenuity work, um, but it's been so remarkable that it has and it's lasted so long, you've had the opportunities to, 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 to you know, push, push the, the envelope, so to speak, of what's available to the scientists. So how are we holding up? Um, this is actually an old slide only going up to flight 13, but it, it's representative uh, in the performance uh, metrics here. I'll go into a little bit of some technical detail here. Um, I'm not sure, you know, where people skew on the engineering or the science side of things uh, in the audience, but but I'll just get into a little a little bit of the nitty gritty. Um, when you have an electric helicopter, what you really care about is your battery's performance, right? That is your that is your fuel system, um, and over time, you want to make sure that the battery is not aging rapidly. You want to make sure that it's behaving on flight one similar to how it did on flight 13, and now we're on flight 31. Uh, I'm happy to report, um, as one of the engineers originally assigned to, to work and look over the battery, um, that the battery is far outperforming anyone's wildest expectations. Um, we have six of these lithium ion cells. Um, we've never balanced them, um, and, and they're within three millivolts of a deviation from each other. Remarkable matching really goes to speak to the original designer, Marshall Smart. Uh, he binned these magical six cells, I think out of like 100 or 200 that, that he purchased offline. Um, and he found the perfectly matched in terms of impedance, uh, performance over temperature. 
um, you name it, and, and, and our battery has, has been holding up exceptionally. Uh, same thing with our solar panel. Our solar panel measurements and predicts are lining up remarkably well, uh, which helps inform us for the next aircraft design, right? Uh, we now have ground truth aircraft data to know that, yes, these off-the-shelf solar cells are, are performing as we expected. Uh, this is the cell spread I was talking about. So we started off at around three millivolts. We've climbed now to six, uh, seven, maybe close to nine, 10. Again, remarkable performance for, for off-the-shelf batteries. This is a, a beautiful uh, internal view of our battery pack before we had integrated all of our boards around it. Um, here are some seasonal air density plots. Uh, so we designed, so Mars salt, so the beginning of our mission was salt zero. Uh, Sol 43 is, is, you can think of around when uh, the helicopter mission started. And the black line here, so x-axis is time, y-axis is air density. And the natural environment on Mars has this, this cycle of air density across the year. Um, so starting off at 016, it then dips down uh, as you get into the summer uh, time period. Uh, so the planet heats up, as it heats up, the air becomes less, the air expands, the air becomes less dense. Um, and then back into winter where you get higher density, but now you have to deal with dust in the atmosphere. Uh, the blue circles represent uh, density measurements, right? From the Perseverance meta instrument. Uh, and again, great news to show the correlation between the model versus what's observed. Uh, another interesting tidbit here is showing this red line. This red line represents um, a threshold in air density from an aerodynamic perspective of what is ingenuity capable of uh, in terms of density range. Uh, ingenuity could fly at its original target RPM of 2537 revolutions per minute. So each, each of the rotors are spinning at 2537 RPM. Ingenuity can fly for about 170 seconds at that RPM. Um, but as the density drops below around 014 kilograms per meter cubed, uh, to keep flying, to stay aloft, you actually need to spin the blades faster, right? Which is not something we had planned for originally uh, in the mission, because we only planned for 30 salts. We only planned for one month. No one thought, hey, let's make sure that the helicopter is capable of flying in Mars summer. Um, as we got closer to summer, we started uh, realizing this was going to be an issue for us. Um, we reacted. We were able to uh, command the helicopter and change its, its rotational speed and go from 2537 RPM up to 2700 RPM. That gave us the needed lift. Um, our flight time had a drop because we're less efficient. So we went from 170 seconds flight time to 130. Uh, and then we crossed back over as the density uh, uh, climbed afterwards as, as we went into winter. Uh, so right now we're in winter, air density is higher. Uh, we haven't gotten our 170 seconds of flight time yet quite back because we're waiting for uh, the energy balance to improve, uh, but we'll get there. Uh, some, some other slides on seasonal dust storms. I won't get into this uh, right now. I'd like to save time for questions and answers. Uh, motor performance, again, I'll, I'll skip ahead here. Um, a couple more slides. I keep talking about the future and saying next generation. Um, what is that gonna look like? So, so this is Mars Science Helicopter. This is a, a design, a research concept. Um, for what we all may be seeing flying on, around the skies on Mars in, uh, in, in the decades ahead of us. Um, we sat down with a room of scientists before Ingenuity ever had its first flight, in fact. It's about two, three years ago. And we asked, hey, imagine there's a bus in the sky on Mars. What would you do with it? Again, speaking to the scientists. Um, what would you do with such a platform? Forget the engineering, forget the physics. Just imagine it's a service available to you. As a scientist, um, what, what would you like to do with such a platform? Um, we heard their feedback uh, and we designed this hexacopter platform uh, to be able to fly around the surface and carry between two to five kilograms of science payload. For, for reference here, Ingenuity is 1.8 kilograms. So we're designing a platform that's more than 10 times the, the mass. Um, the, the, the scale here that we're talking about, this, this rotorcraft, when it's fully deployed, is larger than the rover itself. It's larger than an SUV. Uh, but you need to scale up uh, to be able to carry those sorts of masses. So, so all up mass, we're designing for around 35 kilograms. 
Um, and again, five kilograms is the target for just the science payload. And, and we think we can get two to three different sort of science payloads uh, within that mass volume. And, and that we really think will unlock new kinds of science on Mars um, just because of the access, right? You can now get a scientist's payload um, right up against the cliff wall. You can dive into lava tubes. You can go to the polar regions on Mars. You can go to biologically sensitive areas, sensitive in the sense that uh, areas you might not want to drive over because you don't want to disturb because there could be evidence or, or you know, things that you, you don't want to, you know, like specific rock structures or sand structures that you don't want to disturb with your wheels. Uh, an aircraft might be able to hover over and still image or sample. Um, I'll keep going here. Uh, here's a video of uh, an animation we created of Mars Science Helicopter. Um, again, all forward looking right now. This is all pre-decisional for, for planning and discussion purposes. I need to uh, just mention that disclaimer up top. Um, but I, I do believe that you know ingenuity is just the beginning. Uh, the, the goal, uh, I've said it before, the goal in my eyes here for us now is to make flying on Mars trivial. Right. It will never be trivial. Anything in space will never become trivial. There's always risks, there's always challenges, and Mars loves throwing curveballs at us. Um, but the more competent we get at flying at Mars, um, the more we can enable for exploration, for scientists to be able to go to fields like this land, uh, you know, over a specific region of interest and sample while aloft, right? That th those are key enabling capabilities and technologies that aren't around today. And I'm sure that once we develop these technologies, um, that the scientists uh, will, will jump at the opportunity to get their payloads on board. Okay, and uh, last slide here um, before the wrap up. Um, for those of you following along uh, in the news, there have been some announcements uh, lately on the new Mars sample return mission architecture. Uh, the next mission to Mars is called Mars Sample Return, and it's the, it's the, it's the next step in a three-part uh, mission phase here where Perseverance, its goal is to collect sample tubes, hermetically drill into rock, hermetically seal them in, in what look like test tubes, metallic test tubes, um, and then prepare them. Uh, effectively, at that point, they're prepared uh, for the later, for the future uh, uh, launch from the surface of Mars and return back to Earth. The next mission phase is the sample retrieval lander. That's what we're looking at here is a mock-up of the sample retrieval lander. Uh, it'll be launching, I believe, around 28 um, with arrival in 2030, uh, thereabouts. And its function is to receive the samples from the Perseverance rover, launch, load them into a rocket that will be on board. This is the rocket here. Uh, this is the Mars Ascent vehicle. Um, so the lander gets down on the surface, the rover drives up, drives up, transfers its sample tubes over, um, and then loads them into the rocket. The rocket then gets tossed up into the sky, uh, lights its ignition system, uh, and then goes into Martian orbit. The last part is um, ERO, uh, is, is, is the satellite that's going to be orbiting Mars. It will dock uh, with the orbiting sample uh, inside of the Mars Ascent vehicle. Uh, and then carry the samples back to Earth. Uh, the exciting part for, for the helicopter team here is the newest element of this mission is a backup to Perseverance. If something were to happen in the next eight years, uh, for example, um, and Perseverance is not able to deliver its samples to the lander, uh, we're gonna be sending two additional ingenuity scale, uh, but modified, uh, more capable helicopters to aid in that retrieval, uh, sample retrieval mission where these helicopters that we're currently designing, again, are going to look a lot like Ingenuity, um, but we'll have wheels instead of uh, feet and an arm so that e each helicopter could pick up a tube from a cache located on the surface of Mars and fly it over to the lander and drop it off in a workspace and go back, pick up another tube, drop it off in the workspace. Um, I don't have uh, many slides. I don't have any other slides to show on, on, on this architecture. Uh, today, in a couple of months, uh, if you guys would like to hear more, I'm happy, and I, or someone else on my team, I'm sure would be happy to talk on the latest for the uh, sample recovery helicopters. That, that That's our current name, SRH, sample recovery helicopters. Uh, that's currently in development. Uh, I think I'll end it there. Thank you all very much for your time. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to some interesting questions.
Thank you, Teddy. That was absolutely spectacular. Um, Great, thanks. I have a few more questions in case. <laughs> Fire away. Uh, go ahead. No, but Rich, go ahead with somebody else. No, no, go, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, Teddy, one thing I'm, I, I was, I, I almost raised my hand during your diagram of the dust storm. Um, how much is dust impeding um, the efficiency of your solar collector? Sure. So, so we're beating, um, we're beating the performance of, of any prior solar panel that's ever been deployed to Mars. We know, uh, well, I, I should be careful when I say, when I say this, um, that first statement we know is true. We're beating the trend. There's a there's a degradation number, uh, so much percentage per sol that's expected, depending on what else of it is, what part of year uh, it is on Mars, um, mm -hmm. that's expected in terms of degradation. And we're outperforming that. Um, now, is that because of vibration during flight? Is that because of vibration during takeoff and landing? Oh, um, or is that because of crosswind while we fly? Uh, we cannot say for certain. Uh, you know, you, you've got your own personal dust devil. I just realized that. Right, right. So th there is some, so there's air, you know, being sucked down from above uh, and getting shot through the rotor system. And we believe that has a cleaning effect. Um, but uh, the reason I'm saying I'm being careful is that uh, we cannot say for certain what which element um, is, is the biggest contributor to that self-cleaning effect. Yeah. Um, but uh, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, the fact that our solar panel is still performing, we're still alive, we're still recharging ourselves more than a year and a half now on the surface of Mars. Um, and when you stack that up against any other solar panel powered mission, uh, we know there's a positive effect. What's difficult to, to pick apart is the short term effect, right? When you look at the solar panel performance pre-flight versus a minute and a half after flight, uh, you know, you might think intuitively, well, there should be a big shift. There should be a big jump. Um, it's difficult to make that claim because of the, uh, the chemistry and the electronics involved um, because you have a solar panel that's directly attached to a battery without a peak power tracker. I'm getting into the nuance here of the, the electrical engineering, but effectively- We have some uh, in the audience, Teddy, don't worry. Got it. So, so, so because of that, uh, it's difficult to deconvolve the chemical um, voltage and current curve for, uh, from the battery versus the voltage and current curve of your solar panel. Uh, okay. And then on top of that, you have now the effect of your dust and being able to pinpoint exactly, you know, what percentage of change in current or change in voltage is a function of your, your IV curve on your solar panel becoming more efficient because now you're at a lower voltage in your battery. It becomes a little complicated. So, so we've tried doing that. That's still an ongoing effort to try and peel apart that, like, let's say there's X percentage of a change pre or post flight, what fraction is dust? We're still working on that. So in the short term, it's difficult to make the claim, but when you aggregate it over a year and a half, um, yes, uh, obviously th there's some benefit because of our, our flying ability. Rich, you got some okay. other questions? Um, let's see. I already answered one for somebody. He wanted to know what a Mars Sol was, and basically, <laughs> a damn it's Mars. a good question. If you've never heard that the term is, yep. before, yep. yeah, you guys so, aren't on on Sols anymore, are you? Yeah. So a Mars a Mars Sol, of course, is 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 a Mars day, basically when when the sun reaches when the sun's at meridian, how much time does it take it to reach meridian again, more or less? So uh, about twenty five hours, is that right? 24 hours and 40 minutes, they're about. 40 minutes, got it. I'm rounding up. Let's see. Um, somebody was pointing out, and I think this is really a media effect. Uh, the, the question was, uh, it takes seven months to reach Mars and we've landed a helicopter. De de depending on when you launch. Depending on, of course, when you launch. We landed the helicopter and rover. Um, why aren't we seeing the same type of activity uh, on lunar missions. And, and my thought is we are actually, but I don't think they get the same kind of media and, uh, and uh, excitement that the Mars missions do. There's something more exotic maybe about uh, going to Mars because you know, it's got an atmosphere. It's, it's more of a, um, you know, from at least a human standpoint, it's more of a place, right? Whereas the moon is, is um, much more uh, inhospitable, um, but we have a whole, whole 
rash of missions going to the moon right now. I mean, well, there's the there's the Ar Artemis uh, yeah. launch, which I think is now scheduled for Monday. So you should mm -hmm. all uh, uh, tune in for that. Um, what's important to understand is is that NASA's agenda is largely driven by something called the Decadal Survey, right? So, so once every ten years, uh, there's a survey that gets sent out to to the public, and 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 NASA just asks the question, what does what areas of space exploration mm. do, do the scientists around the world want to focus on, right? Um, and and you know, at, from if you look from decadal to decadal, you'll you'll see evolution in that focus. Uh, you'll see changes, right? Uh, and depending on where the science community wants to drive NASA's efforts, uh, that's how NASA reacts. So so you know, why was there a lot of interest in Mars in the past? Well, that's what the scientists were interested in, and and you know, I'm I, I can't speak for NASA. I can't speak, you know, uh, especially with such generalities. Um, but you know, you could imagine if if all the world scientists start saying we want to go to the moon, that's top priority. Uh, you know, we'll see the mission designs changing for that. Hmm. But 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 JPL in general, you know, we we, we one of our main focuses is, is trying to design uh, robotic platforms. Uh, to serve the science community. All right, we have a uh, we have a question from Tasha. Tasha, I'm going to allow you to speak. Um, I'm going to hit that button. And uh, can can you try uh, speaking? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Okay. Cool. Um, <clears throat> I mean, mine was just more. Um, I was just curious. You know, for for ingenuity, ingenuity if if it flies on Earth. And I mean, I assume obviously we're testing it on Earth, uh, but what are some of the differences that you would see in what it was capable of like on sure. Earth? If that's kind of a thing you could maybe speak to a little bit. I'm just really curious. Yes. Like, so so I'll, I'll, I'll split the answer into two parts. Flying ingenuity on Earth in a Mars simulated environment, and then flying, you know, a lot of people ask the question, could you fly ingenuity on Earth in Earth's atmosphere, Earth's density, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the former question is what we did uh, in terms of preparation for, for launch. Uh, we have something called a 25 foot space simulator at JPL. Uh, if anyone, if you guys come down to the LA area and you guys uh, uh, tour JPL, um, depending on if there's tour groups that go up there or not, I, I forgot if it's part of the standard tour, um, but it's a national landmark. It's, 20, it's, a, it's a tin can, 25 feet wide, about six stories tall. And almost everything we've sent to space has been in this facility at one point or another. Um, the beauty of this chamber and, and, and the, the, I mean, the coolness of it, uh, just to say it simply, um, is that you can suck all the air out. You can go to a hard vacuum if you want, or you can squeak a little bit of air back and that'll give you Mars, right? Um, you can specify the exact density that you want to simulate Mars. So that takes care of one part of flying on Mars. Um, but the temperature still not right because you're at room temperature, even uh, you know, at one percent density. So the walls can be flooded with liquid nitrogen uh, through radiators, uh, and you can freeze everything. You can chill the entire chamber down, so you can get the density and the temperature right. Um, it also has a solar simulator. So there's these massive 37 kilowatt bulbs in the basement uh, outside the chamber, and there's this. I think it's a quartz window uh, uh, that allows light through, but still maintains the vacuum and then a big reflecting dome at the top. And then it'll beam down on whatever you put in there. Uh, so you can get the solar simulation, you can get the temperature and you can get the air density. Uh, that's almost everything. You don't have gravity right. So we needed to build a gravity offload system uh, that we placed inside the chamber uh, and tugged with fishing line uh, from above and, and didn't never picked up the helicopter, but just provided the, the, the requisite uh, offload force um, to, 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 to take off effectively two thirds of the gravitational force that Ingenuity was feeling here on the surface of, uh, here on the surface of Earth. Um, and that two thirds offload gives you one third, approximately one third uh, remaining. And that's what Ingenuity feels like on the surface of Mars. So you combine all of that and that's the closest you could get on Earth to flying on Mars. The second part of your question, could Ingenuity fly within Earth's atmosphere? Um, so AeroVironment, our partners have actually created a, uh, uh, we call it Terry instead of Ginny, uh, the terrestrial demonstration. Uh, so, so they created their own um, 
ingenuity scale uh, helicopter. Um, and instead of flying, uh, instead of spinning its blades at 25, 37 RPM, they slow them down. They go down to around 400 or I think 500 RPM. Uh, mm -hmm. You could think of Earth as like a thick soup, right? Uh, compared to Mars. So because of that, you got to spin, you, you move much slower your rotor blades because the air is that much thicker. It's like trying to swim in concrete, like liquid concrete. Think of it like that. Um, now, uh, I'm not an aerodynamicist, uh, so I won't go too much in the, into the details. Uh, so I don't get myself in trouble, um, but the, the efficiencies are way off, right? You design blades for the Reynolds number, for the specific density, for the specific performance that you, that, that you intend to fly in. You take Ingenuity, Ingenuity's airfoil and spin it in Earth, uh, your efficiencies are gonna, not going to be comparable. Um, now, it still flies. Uh, I flew it myself once. I'm an RC uh, helicopter pilot, had a lot of fun, <laughs> had a great time with it. Uh, so, so yes, you can build something that looks like Ingenuity. Um, but if you were to take Ingenuity and try and spin it here on earth, um, bad things would happen. You'd probably overheat the motors pretty quickly. Uh, and and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't guarantee the outcome. All right. Thanks for the question, Tasha. Um, yeah, thank you. That was great. Sure. Um, let's see. Anybody else? Oh, I have several. <laughs> oh, go for it, Dave. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. It's all much. yours now. Okay. Uh, gosh, um, uh, where to start? Um, um, uh, Teddy, I, I heard from one of your colleagues at JPL and this will person will go without a name. And I'm wondering if this is an apocryphal story, but that when you guys were first, uh, came up with this crazy idea of flying a helicopter on Mars, you went to one of the drone makers and asked them if they could make a, uh, a, a drone that could fly at 100,000 feet, which is uh, the approximate equivalent of the uh, of the atmosphere on Mars. And they said to you guys, we already have. Is that short story true or not? I'm not familiar with that story. I would think you would be if it was true. So maybe somebody was telling me a bit of a tall tale. Okay, the 100,000 feet is accurate. 100,000 feet is, on Earth is about what it is on Mars in terms of uh, air density, but I'm not sure of that uh, story. Okay. Okay. Uh, you might want to ask Mimi and, and, and Bob as well. See if, I will. If they've heard the story. If, by the way, if, if, if it is true, please get back to me or if it's not, because I've been, I, it's such a great story. I've been spreading it. So sure. I, I may be spreading misinformation. Um, how long does it take you guys to fully charge the battery under optimal conditions so you can fly? Does it in, several days? In, 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 no. In the tech demo, which was around springtime on yeah. Mars, uh, we could, we energetically, we could have flown every day. So, so we tried flying around noon, uh, that lopped off around 25% of our SOC. Um, and then for the remainder of the afternoon, we would recharge our batteries and get close to a hundred before getting into the, going into the night. Uh, so, so once per salt, uh, or one flight per salt, we could have accomplished energetically operationally. There were other challenges and reasons why we couldn't do that. Yeah. Um, so it sounds to me like you can fully charge uh, the drone, the battery, in about six hours. Is that right? Yeah, about uh, assuming you were bootstrapped from the prior saw at a good SOC. Yeah, yeah. If okay. you start off at zero at sunrise, not necessarily. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Um, uh, I, as I understand it, the rotors turn at the speed of sound on Mars. No. At, at, is that wrong? No. Uh, we spent we, we spent around uh, uh, zero point eight Mach. Okay, and how fast is that? Again? Well, actually, you, you, you've given me twenty seven hundred. Right. Yeah, it's you've given the number. Well, so 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 twenty five thirty seven is our standard RPM. We bumped up to twenty seven hundred for summertime, and then came back down to twenty five thirty seven. Uh, I can do the the two pi r calculation here uh, in the background, but um, I can do it myself. Yeah, Katie, yeah. To. So so so. so uh, during springtime, we were at point, the tip, the, the, the tip of the blades, the fast moving part is around 0 0.8 Mach. Wow. Now there's, wow. there's some other, there's some other velocities you need to keep in mind. Um, something called an advance ratio, right? So as you're moving forward, there's an yeah. advancing blade and a retreating blade. And depending yeah. on a, how fast you're moving and B the wind speed, those velocities can stack up and get you close to transonic. You, you are close to transonic on the tips as a result of that. Wow. Right. Um, but, but in general, we, we, we try and keep our tips around point eight mark. Okay. And when we're saying transonic, of course, we mean transonic on Mars at, at that air density, not of yes. course, transonic on the Earth. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, let's see. Um, any other stories here? Um, actually, I think you've answered them. Uh, what What is obvious to me, though, is that the drone is become, going to, once you once the once perseverance gets up into the delta with a much rougher terrain that it's going to be navigating the drone is actually its its value is actually going to increase in terms of scouting ability because you were talking about you know maintaining that flight profile so that you know your altimeter would would work yep. effectively uh, but you're going to be able to go into terrains that are going to be i mean would be impossible to to take the rover into yeah, exactly. That, and that's the hope. Uh, the hope is that is that. Uh, well, let, let me back up for a second. Let me explain how flight planning works. Um, today, the way flight planning works is we have a notional cadence of flying once every two weeks. Uh, if you look at our flight log online and you ignore some of our anomaly windows, that was our goal for the year. And I think we've 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 been pretty pretty good about sticking to one flight every two weeks. Um, the week before a flight, we'll sit, typically uh, we would sit down with the scientists and the rover planner and say, "Hey, where would you guys like us to go? Right? There's this is where we are. This is where the rover is. We need to stay around a kilometer apart for telecom leash reasons, um, and as a re and, and depending on what the if there's intervening terrain or not. But uh, ignoring all that for a second, we pretty much just ask and say, "Hey, where would you guys like us to go? Uh, might the rover planners have some you know safety uh, scouting flights? Right? If if they're concerned about the rover going to some uh, untoward terrain, um, or uh, if the rover planners are content with their with their scouting info, the scientists might have uh, something like an outcrop that they won't again not invest rover time on, but they'd like images of. That's the typical way you do it. Um, and then there's a third option, which is if the heli team has uh, its own desires, uh, either for uh, check a checkout of a system like after an upgrade for example you want to shake out the system um, or some technology demonstration let's go super high uh, let's go super fast right let's keep pushing the envelope that's the typical flight planning process and going back to your question uh, once we get up the delta yeah it's going to be again what we're going to ask um, do you guys need scouting for planning do you guys need scouting for science um, otherwise we're going to try and forge ahead as best we can it is it is uh, the, the most comfortable thing for us is to be far ahead of the rover right that is our goal at all times we want to be far ahead because uh, you could imagine if we get left behind if, if we start lagging behind rather and the rover's making forward progress um, because we're a tech demo because we're not a critical part of the mission uh, it is with good reason the rover should not wait for us right they have an important mission ahead of them uh we need to bring back six pounds of rocks or five pounds or whatever it is uh in 10 years back to earth and uh you know th at this point our our mission is you know uh not i wouldn't say sprinkles on top there's there's good there's good engineering and scientific value but it should not be at the cost of the core uh, science mission of 2020. so so we want to stay ahead uh, we want to be scouting. Again, this new terrain should be exciting. Uh, right. and, and hopefully uh, we find some things that people didn't expect. Here's a here's an uh, interesting question. What do you think is the potential for flying humans on Mars in a similar type design one day, like 50 years down the road? Or is it just an impossible thought altogether? No, I mean, we've proven that flight is possible. And we already know that we can go from a two kilogram to a 35 kilogram vehicle, right? And bringing payload from zero to, to, to five kilos. Um, it's a matter of scale, scale and efficiency, right? Uh, if you're, if the question is like, will physics allow? It's like, yeah, you get a large enough lifting body. Yeah, you can do it. Uh, how would you build such a thing and fit it within a rocket? That's another challenge altogether. Sure. Uh, I think what's more likely is that if, you know, if, if humanity wants to build aircraft that will fly at Mars that are capable of carrying humans, they need to be assembled at Mars. Yeah. Right. For sure. um, but uh, yeah, I'm confident one day it'll happen. You, know, I'm, I'm, uh, you, you can put me on record today predicting that, like, yeah, that <laughs> one day that, that, that there will be a glider uh, that an astronaut will use. Uh, and there, there are other NASA centers have worked on glider concepts, uh, autonomous, you know, robotic gliders. Um, but, you know, gliders are a lot more efficient than helicopters are. Um, they, required airfields right uh that you know to take off and land which is why we went with a helicopter design um amongst other trade-offs um but uh but yeah i'm sure it'll happen one day
like all problems, it comes down to supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyone else? It's your I last chance. One. I got another one. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one that just popped up. Oh, you know, is it, what does the helicopter sound like? Stand by. Let me, there's a video of it, and I can put it in the chat. Uh, engineer. Engineer. Uh, in the chamber, um, what it sounds like, I'll, I'll do a horrible impersonation of it right now over my microphone. It, it's, a, it's a low, loud bird noise. It sounds like burr. Uh, not too dissimilar from, a, from like a small propeller aircraft. Um, let me see if I can find it. I, I, I'll, I'll keep looking for this in the background. Why don't we go to the next question? And then if I can find the video, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, Dave, you had one? Uh, I have three or four, but I, I'm going to try to restrain myself. Um, no. we're, we're, we're actually planning. I don't know if folks in the audience realize this. We're planning on flying a vehicle in the Titan atmosphere. I believe it's called Firefly, if I remember the name. Dragonfly. Dragonfly. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have a speaker on that too, Teddy. And if you want to make some suggestions, I was thinking of having Chris McKay talk about it, but if you have somebody else down there, I'd be very interested. Um, are those folks interfacing with you guys and saying, yeah. uh, what are, what is, what is the conversation back and forth? What are you yeah. saying you should watch out for? What are they asking you about? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so we're working with the, uh, with the Dragonfly team and a lot of it uh, right now has to do with the operations lessons, lessons learned. Um, you know, Titan is a different atmosphere. It's a different beast altogether. Yeah. Right? So, so, so um, you know, some of the engineering know-how, engineering lessons learned don't directly apply because of the differences. Just, you know, the atmosphere is about, twice as dense as the Earth's, if I remember correctly. Exactly. It's, it's more, you know, some, some people talk about it's like, it's a, it's a flying submarine, right? More so than, 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 than ingenuity, which is like a leaf, you know, flittering about <laughs> in the air. Um, you can carry a lot more mass um, because the air is so much more dense. Uh, they actually have a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, an RTG, like the rovers have, uh, no solar panels, right? So, so it's a much larger, much more capable uh, aircraft uh, from a science perspective. Um, whereas Ingenuity, like I said, it's not even, you know, just about four pounds. So a uh, completely different regime in terms of flight. Uh, but we are working closely with them in terms of uh, knowledge transfer of lessons learned, right? Here's how we plan flights. Here's our operations cadence. Here's how we map out uh, priors uh, and intended landing sites. Um, and and because, because their vehicle is different, because their sensor suite is different, you know, they may tackle that problem a little bit differently than we did. Uh. Um, they also, you know, were not designing for just 30 souls. They're designing for much different uh operational timeline so some of it apply some of it may apply some of it may may not uh but but we're trying to offer whatever we can a uh, couple cu couple questions here uh another another uh good question from tasha um have dust devils or other wind features caused problems with the safety of the craft and is there plan to seek shelter by some natural rock formations or you know, adjacent to the rover if there's uh, uh some kind of storm or you know sure. dust storms or anything like that so no plans to seek shelter um, and it has caused uh, impacts to our schedule. Uh, so, so back in January, um, uh, there was a unseasonably large dust storm uh, that that we caught wind of. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, so, so we we heard about the forecast a couple of sols before we were uplinking for flight. As a result, we stood down and, and we didn't fly. I think for about a week and a half. Um, so yeah, the dust storms are a concern. Uh, and, and when we know that there's one coming, we just cancel our flight ops and just, right. uh, try, try and weather the storm. I just put in the, uh, chat, uh, a link to NASA JPL's YouTube, uh, uh, page. And that's a clip mid flight, um, from one of our flights, our engineering model flights. And you can hear what the helicopter sounds like. It, it, it that, that is not by the way, how it would sound on Mars. Uh, the Perseverance rover has a microphone recording of Ingenuity flying. Um, uh, th this microphone from the chamber was like rigidly attached to the chamber wall. So the acoustic coupling is going to be much 
different are much more different uh, compared to the free space propagation of your sound waves on Mars. Uh, there's a lot more attenuation on, um, for, from Perseverance's perspective. You guys could find that. Just Google Perseverance microphone recording of ingenuity, and it's a much more dull, uh, uh, lower uh, an amplitude uh, uh, sort of sound. Uh, I also want, want to recommend listening to the sound of the wind on Mars, yes. uh, which I found haunting. Yes. Uh, it's the whole idea. Uh, and you can just imagine yourself standing on another planet. And yeah. that is, that's also there somewhere on, on that website. I'd also like to give a plug for Sky and Telescope because they have a wonderful article about, about, uh, about ingenuity. And uh, actually, if I can turn to the right page, you can see tonight's speaker. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Forgive me for slowing, gumming up the works here. But uh, there's Teddy with Mimi. And I think that's Bob there, if I've got yep. that. And there you are uh, doing the testing. Uh, I presume at the big giant tin can. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's in the control room outside of uh, the big giant tin can. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, we've got one more question here. Um, barring uh, the unexpected, right? Um, is there any limit on how long ingenuity can continue to fly? Like battery life, number of yeah. recharges, we that get this type question. of thing. We get this question all the time. And, and yeah. uh, to be frank, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the, I, I, I really meant it when I said we're, we're outside of our warranty period here. Um, <laughs> and, and every day could be our last. Uh, tomorrow, we could find out, hey, ingenuity is no longer talking with us. And that'll be the end of our mission. You know, if that if we lose comms, we'll try a handful of times to try and regain comms just to make sure it wasn't human error or a scheduling error or something like that. Um, but the, the analogy I gave about bending a piece of metal, that's a real threat. OK, right now we're in the middle of winter and the temperature swings are going from around like positive 20 degrees Celsius down to negative 90 every single night. That is a massive temperature swing for a little solder joint to experience. OK. Um, it's been a miracle that ingenuity has survived for last 130 souls in this condition. Uh, one of our sensors has failed as we think as a result of the, of the cold cycling. Thankfully it wasn't a flight critical sensor and that's why we're still able to fly. Um, and we're hoping that the freezing will stop in the next couple of weeks ahead of us. Um, but even then, once that, uh, if we make it through winter and we no longer freeze, Every soul still maybe maybe you're not bending the joints this much but maybe you're just bending the joints slightly right uh, and and cy cycle after cycle after cycle that's one failure mechanism. There's another failure mechanism which might be uh, will incur will will have a single event upset right. So radiation or some particle may come in and hit our uh, cell phone mm -hmm. processor uh, and that'll cause our processor to hang up mid flight. Thankfully, that hasn't happened in the one hour of flight time or 57 minutes of flight time we've had so far, um, but we could get unlucky there. That's another failure mechanism. Um, there's 50 other failure mechanisms. Um, so uh, there's, no, there, there's no hard line in the sand of, of uh, exhaustion of a single component that I can point to and say, well, the batteries will fail after X or the solar panels will fail after X. Uh, we're, you know, all of our components have already you know, exceeded their lifetime and we're, we're, we're effectively just learning one day at a time, hey, are we still good? Are we still good? Are we still good? And then thankfully the, the answer keeps coming back uh, green across the board. Um, I have a question. I, I found it uh, interesting that you're using a Zigbee transmitter uh, for, for uh, you know, this is, a, this is a common radio used in Internet of Things technology, yep. right? It's off the shelf. You can buy them on Amazon, you know, if you want to. <laughs> um, to, to. To what extent did you harden that transmitter or how, how close to off the shelf is it? Uh, when you say harden, you mean against radiation? Against all, all of the elements that you're dealing with, sure. including um, radiation, sure. Uh, almost no hardening. Well, so for that component specifically, uh, almost no hardening. Um, hmm. uh, and it's, it's almost stock uh, in terms of the software. We're not, I don't think we need the specific Zigbee spec from that year to the T. We, we made some customizations to, 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 to the firmware uh, on the radio. Um, but it's that, you know, it, it's, it's from a Zigbee kind of, you know, intended uh, radio product. 
uh, it's called the Cyflex radio. I think it's it's uh, they, they went out of business, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the hardware manufacturer. But you know, the core of it's still just like a regular Zigbee well, radio. This means my thermostat's going to last forever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I got one more question. Go for it, Dave. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, uh, and Teddy, I, if I remember correctly, it was maybe on flight six or seven or somewhere around there. Uh, the the drone ran into some tr trouble in terms of stabilization. Um, was there a, a, a crosswind effect that was not anticipated? What happened? No, no. Uh, and there's, uh, I, I encourage you to check out the blog post about this. I think uh, Havard Grip, our chief pilot, uh, wrote a very nice detailed article on this if you want to uh, hear some more. I will. Um, no, what, th there wasn't a, a, an outside effect. This was uh, internal. Um, and it was actually a commanded oscillation, if you will. Um, so in, in feedback control systems, right, delays or lags can result in, in oscillations. Effectively, you, you cut your margins down. And when you cut your margins down, now you, you, your, your control and your observation may get out of phase and that may result in an oscillation. If it gets too bad, you can go become unstable, right? And yeah, then you can actually yeah. break things. Um, that's the, the overarching summary. I'll get a little more detailed now. Um, the way Ingenuity works and the way 99% of UAS is uh, little quadcopters. If any of you bought toys for, for any children in your, in your lives uh, from the mall, you know, little mall kiosk and little quadcopter, uh, the way they all work, if they're image based, um, is that you have a very high rate um, IMU system, which is prone to drift. And then you have a low rate camera system. Which is which doesn't drift, but it's low rate, right? Um, the beauty of of the state estimation field here, uh, the navigation process uh, is based off of something called Kalman filter, and mm -hmm. variations on that more capable versions called extended Kalman filters, which fuse your drifty high frequency data with your non drifty uh, low rate data, and mm -hmm. gives you the best of both worlds. Right? Okay. Um, to do that in code, to do that effectively, you need to keep track of time very well. You want to make sure that your latest high rate data is perfectly time aligned with the latest image. So, so as an image comes in, you find the best timestamp to insert that image and you make sure that that's aligned uh, as best you can. And there'll be some slop, there'll be some variation there, but you need to make sure that that's aligned. If you make a mistake or if there's some effect that causes you to misalign, what will happen is, is that this image which tells you that from one thirtieth of a second to one thirtieth of a second later that the rock that was here now moved here, which tells you you translated sideways. If you misalign that image and that image data specifically with a different IMU packet, now there will be a, a disconnect in your, in your navigation system. And there'll be disagreement about your high rate data and your low rate data. One will say that you translated to the side, let's say a half a meter. Another one will say you translate it to the side uh, 40 centimeters. And that difference you can is an error signal. That error signal then propagates into your controller. And now your helicopter is doing the best that it can to deal with now this, this error signal in its controller system. Um, so that, that oscillation was commanded. Uh, mm -hmm. we, the helicopter was, was doing it itself. And what it was doing, it was, it was, it was oscillating around because what happened is, is that at some point in our flight, we, our image that came in, our image data became misaligned by one frame. Mm -hmm. So, so we, our images are taken at 30 Hertz. So once every 30th of a second. So instead of the image coming in here, we were supposed to, it came in late. And mm -hmm. when it came in late and our extended Kalman factor filter kept propagating its data forward, um, that misalignment resulted uh, in the oscillation. Thankfully, there was enough margin in our system, um, thankfully, to handle that, that oscillation and not go unstable. Yeah. Uh, and, and the beauty of it is at the end of the flight, uh, when, we get to, when we get close enough towards our terminal coordinate, um, we fly by waypoints, effectively just you know, volumes in space. We try and hit yeah. that volume in space, then we go to the next waypoint. When we got to our terminal waypoint, right above our landing location, we uh, and then we start landing, we stop tracking features with the camera. As soon as we stop tracking features with the camera, we're just using the IMU itself. The, the oscillation went away. stopped. Yeah. Problem completely went away. Yeah, right, yeah, and then yeah. we just and then we were locked and dialed in, and then we came down nicely and gently. Um, what we found, we, by the way, 
I, I think you said it was either six or seven. There, there that's, were there. That's what I remember. But yeah, I yeah. I'm getting old. Uh, do, do, check the go, go check I'll the check blog it. post, please. I, I will. Um, but but we we did a big investigation after that. We we narrowed down the the root cause, um, and and we came up with a flight software patch um, that would detect if there were a misalignment, right? And if there were a misalignment, we'd effectively like force a realignment. And and we haven't uh, seen an issue like that since. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that's it for tonight. And uh, Teddy, Hi. thank you so much for talking with us. And uh, Dave, did, was there something you wanted to add? I just want to uh, put in a plug for ne next month's speaker. But oh, great. To, Go for I it. I also yeah. want to compliment Teddy. This has been one of the most fascinating and amazing talks we've had. Uh, and I, I bet you there's a lot of it. Very excited people out there because I certainly am. I mean, Teddy, Appreciate my it. compliments, please pass along our compliments to your whole team, to everybody over there. I mean, we're all indebted to you guys for, for doing this incredible stuff. And we're just the voyeurs that enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, uh, we, we, I, I thank you. And we all thank uh, everyone for, for their support. You know, the, the more excitement that, that people have for ingenuity and space flight in general, uh, it, just, it just makes our, our jobs that much better. So, so thank you all for having me. Thank you for taking the time on, on oh. your Saturday evenings to talk with me today uh, and wish you all the best. I just wish all our tax dollars were this well spent. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, Dave, uh, okay. we, we, your plug. Okay, my plug. Next month, uh, in a, not for something completely different, uh, next month we're having Dr. Jinan Du, who's uh, an astrobiologist at Stanford University. Uh, and uh, I mean, I just love astrobiology talks. And we're making great progress now. We are now, of course, with James Webb Space Telescope, we're able to do spectra on exoplanets and see if they may have the biomarkers for life. So, oh uh, boy, just think, Teddy, maybe in a few few hundred years, somebody will be flying a drone on one of those exoplanets. There you go. There you go. Thank you very much, folks, for listening to our program. All right. Stay well, everyone. Good night. Good night.